Well, good evening, good evening, good evening, and good evening to Martin Street and all of God's people. Again, I want to welcome you here to our Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. We're going to get started tonight, as we always do, by looking unto the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus, again, Lord, we thank you. Oh, Lord, we thank you for just being able to wake up this morning and see the dawning of a new day. We thank you, Father God, that you've allowed us to be able to come into your presence and study your word. And now, Father God, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us and speak Speak to us in such a way, Lord, that we know that we have heard from you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Let all of God's people say amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah to God be the glory again. I want to thank you so very much for joining us, amen, for our Wednesday night Bible study. For those that do not know me, my name is the Reverend Dr. Sean J. Singleton, and I am the pastor of the historic and esteemed Martin Street Baptist Church. Amen. You can see that big smile that's on my face. Amen. And so tonight we're going to talk about a, a very important topic, a topic that I want to pose to everybody. Again, you don't have to answer the question for me, but just think about it to yourself. What is your relationship with God? I know that's a mouthful, but, but, but that's a question that all of us have to really have a, a, a concrete answer. And we should be able to answer it at any time. And this came up, um, I, I was listening to a discussion, and the person was asked this question, uh, what was their relationship with God? And, and, and to my surprise, the person began to talk about their relationship with the church. They began to talk about uh, uh, their service in the church, uh, ministries that they worked on in the church, the length of time that they had been affiliated with the same church. They even went all the way back to talk about when they were baptized. But, but, but the one thing that they neglected to get into is, no, no, what is your relationship with God? Not, 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 not what is your relationship with the church? Because the church may think real highly of you, but unfortunately, the church don't have a, 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 a get-out-of-jail-free pass that it's going to give you to be able to make it into heaven. You know, the, the pastor, you know, I, I might think the world of you and just love to see you on Sunday mornings and love to hear your voice, love to hear you sing, love to watch you serve. But that really is not going to benefit you when it's time to get into heaven, what I think about you, because the last time I checked, God is not going to call me in order to get a reference about you when it's time to determine whether or not you go to heaven or hell. And so the, the, the thing that we have to be, make sure is that we, 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 we properly and correctly identify what is our relationship with God, not what is our relationship with the church, not what is our relationship with the pastor, because me loving you ain't going to be enough <laughs> to get you into heaven. And so as I thought about this, then we know how God feels about our relationship with one another. At least we should know how God feels about our relationship with one another. And we should know that because God says in Genesis 2 and 18, when he first created Adam, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And recognizing that it was not good for his creation, uh, man to be alone, God said that, look, I, the Lord God, I'm going to make a help meet for him. And I always tell women, women ought to, women, whatever you want to say about a man, women, you ought to be thankful for, 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 for Adam and his insight. Because the Bible goes on to tell us that everything that God created, every, every, every cattle of, of the ground, every, every bird of the air, God brought every last one of them to Adam so Adam could do two things. One, he could name it. And two, he could examine it to find out whether or not it would be a suitable helpmeet for him. And again, just think about this. You know, think about all the species of animals that God has created. And when you think about it, even if you take a low number, let's say you take a low number like a million. If God brought a million animals to, animal, uh, to, to Adam for him to name and for him to examine, just say if Adam only spent two minutes with each one, 
Do you know how long, how many years it would have taken Adam to go through trying to find a help me on his own? Finally, God said, okay, Adam, you tried to do this thing. You can't find one. I'm going to make one for you. God caused Adam to go to sleep and he created uh, out, of, out of Adam, out of a bone, uh, uh, this thing called woman. And Adam said, it's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And so women, be thankful. That Adam didn't decide what, uh, one of these other creatures was going to be a suitable helpmate for him because then you would have never been, came around at all. But God, <laughs> but God said he knew that he had something even better to create. When he created man, he, he was going to create something even better called woman. And so, but we also know how God feels about our relationship uh, with him. This should, this say, should say our relationship with him. We know how God feels about our relationship with him because in 1 John 3 and 1 it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knew us not because it knew him not. I mean, God is a holy God. I mean, how much, John asked the question, how much does God have to love you and I? That God would allow sinners like us to be called the sons of God. Come on, I mean, just think about how much God has to love us. Based on the sins that we have committed, based on some of the things that we have done, based on some of the things we have said, based on some of the things that we have thought, just imagine how much a holy God like the one we serve has to have loved us and want us to be in a relationship with him that he would allow sinners like us to be called the sons of God, to allow us into his family. To allow us to be in a relationship with him. Just imagine how much God had to love us. He loved us so much, church, that he looked beyond our many, many faults. And he saw our need. And he recognized that what we needed most of all was to be in a relationship with him. But knowing that we needed to be in a relationship with him and knowing that the only way that we could be in a relationship with him was that, 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 that our sins not had to be covered, but our sins had to be forgiven. And as we always say, God tells us that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but instead would receive the gift that's called eternal life. That's how much God loves us. That he would sacrifice his only begotten son. That's, 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 that's a lot of love, church. Because I got two sons. And I ain't sacrificing my two sons for nobody. <laughs> I don't love nobody else that much that I would sacrifice either one of my two sons. But God loved us enough that his only son, he sacrificed for you and I. So then, as we did, again, we think about our, our relationship with God. How would you classify your relationship with God? Again, I'm sorry. The things are not coming. How would you classify? There's, there's only a few classifications in a relationship. It's like now, you know, somebody would ask you your, your marital status or, you know, on, 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 on an application or something. You know, you don't get to give a long dissertation. You know, either you married, you divorced, you widowed, or you're single. That, that's it. You don't, you, don't, you don't have a whole lot of choices, you know, you know when somebody asks you your relationship status. Likewise, when, when, when somebody asks you about your relationship status with God, how would you classify it? You don't get to, to have some long explanation about what you've done and how you... No, no, no. What, are, what is your relationship status? And there's only a few to God be the glory. Are you a sinner living in rebellion? Are you a sinner living in rebellion? 
Well, Isaiah 59, 1 through 3 answers this question and tells us, again, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Hear what Isaiah is saying, y'all. But your iniquities, Isaiah said, have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid your face from a face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongues have muttered perverseness. In other words, again, Isaiah is saying, look, 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 look. It's not that God cannot do for you. No, the hands of God still have all power in his hands. And, and the ears of God are always listening, Isaiah says. So, so if you're not getting from God what you want from God, he's saying, it's not because God can't do it. It's not because God can't hear you. It's because your iniquities, your sins, your sins, he said, has caused a separation between you and God. Because you're living a, a, a sinner's kind of life, a, a rebellious kind of life. Yes, yes, all of us, even saved people, yes, we commit sins. There is a difference between committing sin and being a sinner. Because a sinner just lives in rebellion from God. Saved people, yes, they do commit sin. But sinners, they don't commit sin. They live a sinful kind of life. And that's what Isaiah lays out for us here. You know, that's one classification. Are you a sinner? Living in rebellion. Next, uh, next thing is, 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 are you someone that is strayed away? You know, may, 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 are you somebody that, that has, has been in a relationship with God? You have given Christ your life. But then, because of temptation, because of sin, because of, because of, 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 of all other reasons, you, you kind of strayed away from that path of righteousness. Well, Matthew 7, 13 and 14 speaks to this. And it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in there, thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. In other words, he said again, many, many, many were on this this, this straight path, this, this, this narrow way. But then they, they kind of strayed away to that, to that wide gate, that, that broad way. And that wide gate and that broad way, Matthew says, it leadeth straight to destruction. I, I, I know it looks like it's going to lead somewhere great, but it's really heading to destruction. I, I know you. it looks like it's going to lead to the altar, but it's leading to the grave. It looks like it's going to lead to life, happiness ever after. But I'm here to tell you, it's going to lead you directly to destruction. And so, again, are you someone that has strayed away from that path of righteousness? Strayed away from that relationship? That you had established with God. And lastly, are you someone walking in the fullness of life? Are you someone who, 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 who can truly and honestly say, look, I'm not just living my best life now. Because even sinners out here living their best life now. No, no, that, that, that don't mean anything. The real thing is, are you walking in the fullness of life? And the only way to be walking in the fullness of life here and now is you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. That's it. There's, there's no other way. Romans 5, 18 and 19 speaks to this. It says, therefore, as by many the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification. Of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Yes. 
Have you been down the Calvary's cross? That's if you want. If you're walking in the fullness of life, then the answer is yes. I've been down the Calvary's cross. But not only have I been down there, but I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and I've been justified. Come on, I've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, and because of that. I can now walk in the fullness of life. And again, church, this, 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 I cannot minimize to you how important this is to be able to know how to classify your relationship with God. Notice I'm not talking about your relationship with the church. I'm not even talking about your relationship with the pastor. I'm not even talking about your relationship with your friends and your family and the other people of the household of faith. Because all of those things may be well. But but how do you classify your relationship with God? And how would God classify your relationship with him? Because sometimes we see things different than how God sees it. So how would God classify your relationship with him? Would God look down at you and see you as somebody who's living in rebellion? Does God look down at you and, and, and see you as someone who's now in that far off country because you have strayed away from him? Or does when God look down at you, he sees somebody who is living in the fullness of life? Because there are not many choices here. Those, those are your three choices. Eeny, meeny, or mine. You don't get to choose between both. Eeny, meeny, or mine. A, B, or C. And so what, 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 what I wanted to kind of look, look at real quick is Romans 5, 6 through 11. And, we, and we're going to kind of line this thing so that we can get a good understanding of how it is we get to live in this this state called the, the fullness of joy. Paul starts by saying, you see, and I'm reading this from the NIV version because I really like the way that it, it, it sounds in the NIV version. It, it, you can really see it in the text. Paul says, you see, at just the right time, couldn't it happen in the days of David? Couldn't it happen in the days of Elijah? I know we like to sing the song days of Elijah, but 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 what but, but God had set up, it could not happen in the days of Elijah. It had to happen in just the right time. When we were still powerless. In other words, when we were still living in our sins. When we were still separated from God. That's why we were powerless, because we were separated from the one who had all powers in his hands. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ, Christ didn't die for good folks. <laughs> he didn't die for saved folks. No, Christ died for ungodly people. Yeah, he died for sinners like you and I. And he did it, church, at just the right time. Thank God for his perfect time. Very rarely, Paul says, will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Yeah, 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 I, I know we all want, we want everybody to be righteous. But Paul said, let me tell you something. People don't die for other people because they're righteous. You don't give up your life for somebody because they're righteous. But Paul said it is possible. In rare cases, somebody might give up their life for a good person. You know, somebody been good to you. Somebody been really good to you. Help take care of you. Help provide for you. Paul said then you might give up your life for them. But let me tell you something, church. It's hard talking about giving up your life for somebody that you don't love. And see, just because somebody is righteous, don't mean that you love them. Just because somebody is a good person doesn't mean that you love them. And you're not giving up your life for somebody that you do not love. Because let me tell you something. There's something good about living. People ain't lying enough to give up their life for somebody because they, they're a good person. No, it don't happen that way. 
He also says, but God, church, demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Ain't it amazing that God didn't say, okay, y'all get it all together. Then I'll let Christ die for y'all. I'm not going to let my son die for no sinners. But now you saved folks, you righteous folks, you good folks, you church folks. God, you know, <laughs> I'll let my son die for y'all. No, no. God says, while you're still sinners, while you're still separated from me, I'm going to allow my son to die for you so that you can come back to me. The blood of Jesus is what allows us to be able to come back to God. I know some people, I know, I know that may May, 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 may surprise some people, but Jesus didn't die for good people. He didn't die for church folks. He didn't die for righteousness. He didn't die for, for good people. No, no, he died for sinners. Ungodly people. Since we, since we have now been justified, how? We have been justified not because of anything that we have done, but justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Now, again, the blood of Jesus is what justified us because it's, it's the blood that washes us and makes us white as snow. It's the blood that, 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 that cleans us up so that we might be justified the standing before God. But how much more shall we be saved? If, 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 if sinners can be justified by his blood, then how much more can we be saved through him? Now, if, if, if sinners can be justified by the blood, how much more will God do for people who are living as living sacrifices for him? If God would do this for sinners, how much more will God do for people that truly love him? Come on, somebody. That's why it's important to love God. Because if God will do all of this for people who don't love him, people that are sinners, people that are rebellious, then for people who do love him, how much more will God do for you? That's deep. For if while we were God's enemies, that don't, 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 ever, don't ever forget that. At one point, we were all enemies of God. Yeah, remember there's only three categories. You're, you're a sinner living in rebellion, you're a person that is strayed away, or you're a person living in the fullness of life. And at some point, all of us were sinners living in rebellion. Why? Because we were born in sin and shaping in iniquity. You didn't become a sinner. You were born a sinner. You didn't choose to be living in rebellion. You were born into rebellion. And so at some point, all of us were enemies of God. And while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. But you know, some of us, we, 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 we can't love our enemies. God loves his enemies. But some of us, you know, we, we only can love people that love us back. We only can be good to people that are good to us. We, you see, sometimes we forget that, no, 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 no. God don't just call you to love people that love you. God just don't call you to be good to people that are good to you. No, God said, let me, let me tell you how you ought to treat your enemies. While we were God's enemies, not after we got converted and joined the Lord's army, but while we were God's enemies, God reconciled us back to him. Again, that ought to be a, that ought to be a question for all of us. How do you treat your enemies? 
Now, I don't, now, if I have any enemies, I don't know about them. But if I do have any, I can promise you this, I don't treat them bad. And here's why you ought not treat your enemies bad. Because when you get to heaven, you will not be judged by how other people treated you. That, 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 that is not going to be a criteria in your judgment for how other people treated you. And the reason is they treated Jesus bad. And Jesus said, if they would treat me like this, then what do you think they're going to do to you? And so you, God is not going to judge you based on how other people treated you. But he is going to judge you based on how you treated other people. And I don't believe now, I, I don't know for sure because I've never been through God's judgment, but I don't believe God is going to hold on to the excuses about, well, Lord, you don't know what they did to me. You're, you don't know what they said to me. Yes, yes, he does. He knows exactly what they did to you. He knows exactly what they said to you. He knows exactly how they treated you. And despite what they said to you, what they've done to you, how they treated you, he still says, you're supposed to love them anyway. But you ain't loving them for you, for them. You loving them for you. That's what God did for us. That while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, Jesus. The reason we cannot be reconciled oftentimes be, 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 between one another and, and our relationships stay fractured is because we allow stuff to continue to live instead of letting some stuff die. See, God knew that in order for us to be reconciled back to him, somebody had to die. Something had to, There had to be a death involved. And if, and if we want to be reconciled back to one another, then at some point, that stuff that has been living and that stuff that has been keeping us apart from one another, we got to simply let it die. That's all you got to do. If you want to be reconciled to somebody that has done something to hurt you, then whatever it is that they did, just let it die. If you want to be reconciled to somebody that said something that hurt your feelings, then all you got to do is whatever they said, just let it die. But as long as you hold on to it, as long as you let it live in your heart, in your mind, then, then whatever it is, is going to prevent you from being reconciled. Trying to help somebody. How much more? Having been reconciled. How, now that we've been reconciled, those that have accepted Christ, those that have been down to Calvary's cross, those that have been washed in the blood, that how much more now that you're in the Lord's army shall we be saved through his life? See, 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 we were reconciled through his death. But those of us who know Jesus know that he didn't stay dead. Uh, uh, those of us who know Jesus know that, that after three whole days, he got up early Sunday morning with all power in his hands. Now, if we can be reconciled through his death, then how much more shall we be saved through his life? Why? Because we serve a living God. I, 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 don't, I don't go have to go to no tomb and worship a dead God. Uh, I, I, don't have to, I don't have to go to no graveyard and stand there and worship God. No, the God I serve is a living God. The God I serve is right now we're sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for me. And if through his death I was able to receive life, then what am I going to receive from his life now that he is? Or so much more that God wants to do for us now that we have been reconciled. This, my friends, this is why we need to be saved. So that we can walk in the fullness, not just the fullness of joy. Yes, that I want to walk in the fullness of joy, but so you can walk in the fullness of life. God wants to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. That's what Jesus wants to do for you. 
Not only give you life. He, he, look, he wants to give you life, but he gives you life through his death. But he says, but I also want to give it to you more abundantly. And the abundant life does not come from his death, but the abundant life comes from his life. He lives. I know he lives. My Savior lives today. That's how you get to live in the fullness of joy. That's how you get to answer the question. What is your relationship status with God? Yeah, God, you and God are, are, are filling out an application and he asks your relationship status. What is your relationship status? Sinner living in rebellion? Person that strayed away? Or someone living and walking in the fullness of joy? Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Heaven continue to smile upon each and every one of you. Amen. Amen. Look, and if your relationship status is not where it needs to be, I want you to know that there is hope. And the hope is found in Jesus Christ. And all you have to do is ask him to come into your life. Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins. And ask him to be your Lord and your Savior. And I want you to know that if you can do that, you can go from being a sinner, living in rebellion, directly to a person that's living in the fullness of life. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Amen. Well, again, I want to thank you for joining with us uh, tonight, and I pray that you were blessed, amen, by the lesson, and I, I pray that you will just really examine your life and make sure that your relationship status is where that it needs to be. Amen. And as we get ready to go again, I want to take this time and thank all of you that have contributed to the work of Martin Street Baptist Church. And if you have not done so and you would like to do so, I want you to know that there are multiple ways that you can give to Martin Street Baptist Church. Number one, you can mail in your contributions to Martin Street Baptist Church, which is located at 1001 East Martin Street, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27601. If you live in the Raleigh area, you can drop off your donations at our Family Life Center. There's a box right outside the front door that is always accessible 24 hours a day and checked on a daily basis. If you do electronic giving, you can download the Cash App application to any electronic device. And once you do so, if you put in dollar sign MSBC donations, 100% of those donations come directly to Martin Street Baptist Church. Lastly, uh, you can go to our church website, which is located at www.martinstreetbaptist.org. Once you do so, you'll come to this beautiful front page. If you go into the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the online giving tab. If you click on that, it'll bring you to this page where you'll see that there are multiple ways that you can give unto the Lord as the Lord has given unto you. Always remembering this one thing. God loveth a cheerful giver, and you are never more like God than when you give. Because you know what? God so loved the world that he gave. Amen. And so again, we want to thank each and every one of you for your kind and your gracious giving unto Martin Street Baptist Church and for whatever it is that you do to help us to be able to live out what God has called us to do. We just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And again... I want to thank you for joining us on Wednesday night. We're here each Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And if you've been blessed, please tell somebody so that they might join us also and they might be blessed by the word of God as we continue with our weekly Bible study. And so as I get ready to leave, you know I want to remind you of this, that whenever you are in Raleigh, I want you to remember that all roads lead directly to Martin Street. Amen. God bless you, and I will see you soon.